So, sorry, I just realized I didn't put my, my name on the, on the presentation. I am, I am Jesus Barraza. I'm, I'm the director of telecom solutions with Neo4j. But today, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm wearing a, a different hat. I'm, uh, I'm wearing my semantic technologies kind of expert hat. Because uh, actually, in previous lives, I, I, I did, well, I did my PhD in this uh, semantic technologies area and then spent a few years, well, quite a few, like five, seven years, in industry, in, in, in telco in particular, using RDF and ontologies to solve, uh, solve real-world problems. So, um, so yeah, today I want to talk to you about, about ontologies and how you can, we can use them uh, with, uh, with Neo4j. So let me start with a quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you are familiar with ontologies, use ontologies? That's brilliant. Excellent. So I'll, I'll still do a, a brief introduction just to set the context and the, for those of you who are less familiar with it. So um, yeah, a uh, little bit of context. So, so where are we? So this is a, this is a cool uh, room because we're in AI, which is the topic of the, of the, of the year, I would say. Uh, but lately, you know, AI tends to be seen as a synonym of, uh, of machine learning. And it's, it's not the case. I mean, I've just enumerated some of the disciplines, some of the areas that fall under AI. And you have the robotics, you have natural language, understanding, generation, speech, vision. And there's, of course, automated learning. There's machine learning. But there's also knowledge representation and reasoning, which is the area I'm going to be talking about. And if you want, it's at the other end of the spectrum of machine learning. Because one of the problems with machine learning is you know, we can have a neural network that produces a fantastic model that can tell if this picture is a, is a biscuit or is a, is a dog. But we can't explain why. It just works, right? So there's this black box problem. So at the other end of the spectrum in, in the AI uh, um, kind of um, umbrella is, uh, is knowledge representation, where uh, we will try to make our reasoning explicit. We will try to explain what we know and how do we run these inferences. So it's what we call more explainable AI, if you want. So that's where we are. That's, that's, uh, that's where ontologists fit. And, and, um, and what's the rationale behind knowledge representation? Well, a very simpli simplified view of it is, you know, typically you will see uh, in any solution, you will find uh, your application logic being a fat component, and your data tends to be, a, you know, of course for data-driven applications. But what I mean is, uh, is, is, simple, is, is simple data. So the idea with knowledge representation is make your data smarter. Make your data smarter in a way that you can move some of the application logic uh, out of it and make it data. And by doing that, you can, uh, first of all, you can reuse that knowledge. I mean, you don't have to replicate in any application. You make it explicit, right? So there, there's a number of benefits. And, and, uh, and a great example of, of uh, this idea of knowledge uh, representation and reasoning was uh, at the beginning of the century, uh, the, the vision that uh, mm, Tim Berners-Lee shared about the, the semantic web. If you remember, you know, the web at the time was purely for human consumption. So the data published was pretty, pretty dumb. It was text. What you had at the other end was a client, was an application, it was a customer, a human that had to understand that text. So what, what he said, what the, the proponents of the semantic web said is, why don't we, instead of publishing a natural language text, why don't we publish better structured data, self-describing data, data described in terms of well-defined semantics, smarter data, so that we can do smarter things about it. So we can have applications, general purpose applications that can use that knowledge and, um, and well, that became quite popular, as I say, uh, in, in the early, early 2000s. So, um, so what is an ontology? Because uh, uh, we're talking about knowledge representation. An ontology is a, is a, is a form of representing knowledge. And it's uh, basic. I'm going to go with a, I mean, you can find thousands of definitions in the web, but I'm going to go with a very pragmatic one. So a, a, an ontology is a domain model, right? So it's a, a representation of a particular domain. But it has three characteristics that make it a bit different, a bit particular. And because um, we, we build models for many things. I mean, we, build, uh, we create models when we're going to uh, create a, a, a database, for example. We do the entity relationship model. We create models when, uh, using, using uh, modeling tools. We, we create models when we whiteboard something. But uh, an ontology needs to have these three characteristics. The first one is it has to be a formal representation. So it has to be machine readable. That, that's a key point, right? So it has to have some structured uh, form. Uh, the second one, uh, it's, uh, it's an explicit description of a domain. It, I mean, it's not like a natural language text description. It has to be an enumeration of the entities that, that, that 
belong to this domain and how they relate to each other. So I'm talking about entities connected to other entities. That sounds like a graph, doesn't it? And effectively, it's, uh, you know, the, most of the, you know, the modeling languages, the ontology languages, are based on RDF, which is actually a graph model. So explicit, that's very important. And the third one is the, the notion of, uh, of um, consensuated knowledge. It's a, it's a shared vocabulary. It's typically shared by a community. You can, of course, create an ontology and use it just for yourself, but the, uh, most of the popular ones and the ones that I'm going to be uh, showing today are shared ontologies, agreed vocabularies that are shared uh, by uh, communities. So um, let me show you an example, and I'm not going to, uh, I don't know if that's readable, but uh, that's a fragment of the FIBO ontology. So if there's some of you here that are in the finance industry, you might be familiar with it, so it describes a number of finance terms and, uh, and relationships. And you can see that, well, first of all, it's XML-based. This is a specific serialization. It's using the OWL language. And you can see things like, you know, at the top, there's a description of a class, right? It's a category. So, and it describes what a privately held company is, right? So we see that there's a, some synonyms, like a closed corporation, a privately held corporation. But more interestingly, there's things like subclass of statements. So I'm saying that a, a privately held company is a subclass of a stock corporation, right? That's a bit of knowledge that is going to be useful, and we're going to see that in a minute. So we're making explicit that knowledge, as you can see. It's a formal description. We're making it explicit, because then there's a, a, a description of also of the stock corporation, and it's something that's governed by a board agreement, something that has a date of incorporation. So it, it's, a, it's a formal description of all the elements in that particular domain, and it's shared. I mean, it's governed by the, the EDM council, but it's a shared, uh, it's a shared vocabulary, and it's, and it's quite uh, widely used. Another good example is schema.org. Right? You're all familiar with the knowledge graph, Google's knowledge graph. And when you do a search, you have to realize that on the right-hand side, if there's, a, if there's a, a match with a concept, you will, you will see some, um, uh, um, a description like this one. So this is the human-readable version of it. But if you do a search for this uh, album by Miles Davis, you see that you have the title, you have a description, you have uh, the artist, so a number of elements. And, uh, and that's described according to, uh, to the schema.org ontology. So what you have here is not an ontology definition, is a content, a fragment of content annotated according to that, uh, to that particular ontology. And you see that uh, we're describing that this is, uh, is an album. It has a name. It has a description. It has a genre. And, uh, and it's connected to an artist and to other, other elements. So, so ontologies are, are out there. They're being used. And, um, and I was thinking. Well, I want to benefit from that. I have my data in Neo4j, but I want to, I want to use them as well. So what, um, first of all, before I show you how to use them in Neo, there's two main uses of ontologies, right? So the first one, uh, as I mentioned, is interoperability, right? If it's a shared vocabulary, if I share my data, if I expose my data according to that vocabulary, people are going to be able to use it and understanding because that's, there's a formal definition for it. People are going to be able to define uh, or to construct applications that consume that data, right? So that's, that's one thing. And it's at the core of the whole uh, semantic web uh, concept, right? So it's all about interoperability. That's what that RDF is about. And, uh, and the second one, and, and equally important, is, is inferencing. So as we saw before, an ontology includes fragments of knowledge that I can use to run inferences. An inference is just be able to infer new knowledge out of the knowledge that I have. I have data in my graph database, and I want to derive new facts out of it. So I'm going to be able to use ontologies to do that. So that's, my, that's what I'm, I'm going to try to show. Good. So the first one, I uh, have my data in EFJ as a graph, and I want to expose it as RDF, and I want to expose it according to unstandard vocabulary, and I'm going to use schema.org. What does that look like from the, you know, I want to call it architecture, but what, what, what's, uh, what are the elements involved? Well, first of all, we have Neo4j, of course, as the data store. And I'm going to use an extension that that's uh, I've been working on and I, I've actively developed. That's called NeoSemantics. It's uh, out there in GitHub. You can have a look at it. You can download it. It's actually, I mean, we're around 1,500 downloads. And it's been very well received and, and very good feedback. So it has a number of components that will uh, make it possible to both ingest RDF, to publish RDF, to do things like what I'm going to show today. So these are the two software elements, if you want. And uh, because what I want is to expose my data from Neo4j as RDF, and according to one of these vocabularies, well, one of the things I don't want to do, of course, is to migrate it out and put it, you know, I, I want to do it on the fly. So what I'm going to do is define a mapping, a mapping that uh, matches my data to what are the public uh, um, ontologies? And I'm going to use, as I was saying, 
uh, schema.org, in particular the um, finance extension, which takes concepts from FIBO, but it's a much reduced version of it. And I thought for a demo it was, it was more, more adequate. So that's all I need, right? So my plan is to then run a query on my Neo4j through that extension, a query in Cypher or just a, an HTTP request. I want this component to map the results of my query to that vocabulary and expose it as RDF, right? So that's what I'm going to show. And the second part, and I hope I'll, these are, that's the data in case you want to, to reproduce the whole thing. The data set that I'm going to be using is from uh, the Lending Club. It's, it's uh, loan data and it's, it's public. I'm going to use the, uh, the financial extension of schema.org and uh, I'm going to use the, the new semantic extension. And then after that, I'm also going to show you how we can use that information, how we can use that ontology to run some basic inferences. So let me start. Well, we'll get here in a minute. <laughs> okay, so um, here we go. That's Neo4j. I won't go through the details of the, of, uh, the data ingestion, but there is a, uh, I'll share all the cipher that I, to, to, to get the, the data from, uh, uh, from the lending club and, and bring it into Neo. What I have, and let me run a, a quick query, and, uh, and I'm going to use Bloom for this. So um, let me show loans um, over $30,000 in state, uh, for example, of New York. Uh, and let's set a limit. Let's just show three of them. Okay, so that, that's what, the, just, just to, to, to show what the model looks like, right? So we have a, 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 the notion, I mean, a note representing the loan. We have a note representing the borrower. I mean, it's anonymized data, so we'll, we'll just uh, have a, a, a unique identifier, I mean, a, an ID representing it. And we have also a connection to, to a zip code, and the zip code will be connected to a state. Pretty simple model, right? So that, that's, that's what we have. So. Um, First of all, let me uh, show you how I can uh, expose uh, some of that data as RDF. And I'm going to, oh, that's not very readable. Let me do this. Oh. So that's, that's, uh, that's using the browser to, to send a GET request to the, to the extension, right? To the semantic extension that I'm showing. And the only parameter I'm passing is an ID, is an ID of a loan. So if I run this, we're gonna get an RDF representation. If you're familiar with RDF, this is a, um, a turtle serialization of the data in my, in my graph. So I get all the properties, all the attributes of my loan, right? And the connection to the borrower, the connection to the state, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just plain mapping to RDF. And I'm not gonna go into the details. I mean, there's plenty of information out there. There's even talks where I presented that. But what I want to do now is uh, I wanna be able to define a mapping, right? And say, well, I want that uh, let me see how I go back from here. Good. So I, I want to um, define, oops, here we go. Run this fragment. As I say, I'm, I'm gonna share it in, in after, after the talk, but essentially what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm defining a, a, a namespace, a link to the, to the vocabulary that I'm gonna use, and a number of sort of key value pairs. So this, I'm saying this property in my graph corresponds to this property in the, in the schema.org. This category, this label, corresponds to these other categories. So again, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over it, but if, if, you, if you want to know a bit more, please come back, uh, come to me after that. So uh, I have a mapping now, right? And I'm going to rerun the request to the, to the transactional endpoint. And as you can see now, some elements, the ones that I've mapped, oh, that's not readable again, sorry, uh, are now described according to the, um, to the schema org ontology, right? So you see that the amount, so I've, I've mapped only some of them, but you see that this transformation is carried on the fly. And I, could, I can actually, um, use these uh, as a way of, um, of kind of exposing just a portion of my data, because if I add this parameter where I'm only showing the map data, I can expose just a portion of my data that's mapped to the, to the ontology in this case. So this is exactly the same information, but only exposing the elements in the, in the scheme, map to the schema.org ontology, right? So again, I can go into the details later on if you're interested uh, or the mapping, but uh, the idea is that, um, I mean, we have a graph and we want to map it to a graph. So that simplifies a lot the task of defining that mapping. So that's the first thing, the first uh, part of the demo that I wanted to show. Um, and very quickly, second part, uh, 
I'm not going to show how to do it, but you, you can also run Cypher and, and, and expose bigger, bigger parts of your model. But the second one is, is about inference, and, and that's, uh, that's, I think that's, uh, that's an important one. So um, the idea is that uh, I want to import an ontology now. I want to bring the ontology into the graph because I'm going to use it to, to, to run uh, the inferences, right? So uh, I can do something like uh, stream the data from an ontology, and I can get the, the schema.org one. Right, so this is basically getting the, the, the triples from the ontology and streaming them into Neo, and I can build a model, and that's what I've done. So now I have uh, um, my, um, the, a copy of the schema or ontology represented as nodes, so I have labels there, and the labels are connected to each other through sub-label sub of. So it's a simplified view of, uh, I'm finishing, just one minute, sorry. Uh, a simplified view of the ontology. So the idea is that I now have this representation of the ontology in Neo4j, and I'm going to use it to run some inferences. And what I can do is, okay, I, I'm going to hook my model, which contains loans, to the ontology. So what I'm going to do is I'm saying, I'm going to create a new entity in my ontology that's loan, and I'm going to say that it's a subclass of, uh, of the loan concept in the, in the um, schema.org ontology. So what I can do now is say, okay, get me all the financial products in the database. And as you can see, there's no explicit description of any loan as a financial product. But I can run this request, and I will get the loans, because loans have been described as a subcategory of financial product in the schema.org ontology. I don't know if it's making sense. Sorry, I have to finish. It's just a lightning talk, but uh, I, any questions I'll take uh, after this. Thank you very much. <laughs>